Radio, 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 book tour. Radio, 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 book tour. Radio, 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 book tour. Four and three and two and one, one. Welcome aboard. It's time to meet your hosts, Lawrence Peters and Jessica Pomeranz. Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Radio Book Tour. My name is Lawrence Peters, and uh, I want to invite you onto the Radio Book Tour bus. This is our first show. It's in the nature of a preview of what you can expect in the next three episodes devoted to the city of Baltimore and to the Baltimore writers who live there. Jessica and I recently took a trip up 95 to that city's book festival, and we will be talking about this and the great writers we met and uh, the kinds of impressions we had of the city. But first, uh, we wanted just to talk about the show itself, why uh, we exist, and, and the kinds of things that we're going to talk about. This relationship between books and writers and the cities that they come from. You know, so we've got yeah. this whole thing about travel. So it works two ways. We travel to people who don't really want to travel to us. They're very happy living in their own little communities, or big communities, for that, that matter, and draw inspiration from them. And don't necessarily look to New York or Washington or some other fancy place, L.A., another one, where writers are supposed to congregate, but are very happy being in their own small community or large community, but not necessarily Washington, L.A. What do you think about that, Jessica? Yeah, I, I think that is, I mean, as a person that's never listened to a literary podcast, uh, I think what interests me about the concept of this podcast, about Radio Book Tour, uh, besides being in motion and besides being on, a, on the hunt, on the investigation, mm -hmm. uh, to find what the great literary centers are and what the, what the literary meccas of the future will be, if mm -hmm. any. So if, they're, if we're all living our lives on the internet and we're all living our lives in podcasts, how much does place matter? Now, uh, so when we, when we went to Baltimore, it turned out place mattered a whole lot to the writers there. And as, uh, as an ins aspiring writer, as somebody who's been trying to write for a really long time and who's also been very migratory, uh, I just think it's interesting to hear that some writers think that where they live is the place to be for writing. And I want to mm. find those places yeah. and I want to find the next writers in those places. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what's interesting to me, this kind of uh, geo journalism that yeah. presupposes that uh, places do matter and right, right. that a certain kind of writing that couldn't, couldn't happen anywhere else, couldn't happen in New York or LA or, uh, a major city could happen in a place, uh, in a small town USA or mm -hmm. uh, on an island or right. wherever wherever we might discover. And that's and, what I think is and compelling. Could, and I think what your point is could only happen there because I think what we discovered in Baltimore, and I certainly discovered in Baltimore, is there was a unique Baltimore voice, a yes. Baltimore sensibility that was totally part of the city. And unless you really understood the city, you really couldn't appreciate as much about the literature and the poetry and the various things that are coming out of that city. Um, and so it's kind of an educational program as well. All right. So, for example, let's preview a little bit. We've got Deborah Ruddesell, who is a historian, uh, talking to us in the first uh, podcast. Uh, this will be this podcast. We're going to do three programs on Baltimore, so she's going to be in the first one. And she's going to set the scene. She's going to tell us uh, basically how Baltimore became Baltimore uh, and, and what are the distinct kind of fractures and tensions and issues that Baltimore's dealt with historically since early on in the 18th century. And we're going to follow that up with some other people who are going to be witnesses to some of that Baltimore history. So there's an educational mission along with what else, what, what we just said, which is we also want to discover these new writers. We want to discover things about cities that have not been expressed or exposed. That was good. 
What do you think about? Uh, I mean, you, you. Uh, I mean, you. You, you scored a great uh, interview with uh, Rafael Alvarez. Talk a minute about because we're previewing right now. We're previewing the show. What what struck you about Rafael Alvarez? He uh, just give a give a short little description of his bio, if you don't. Okay, mind. Rafael Alvarez. Uh, I think is, um, uh, if I may say. Uh, classic Baltimore resident. He loves Baltimore so much. He lives in his grandfather's home and he plans to hand that down uh, to his son and he expects uh, to always have his family home in Baltimore. He loves it so much. Uh, And he covered Baltimore when he worked for the Baltimore Sun. Uh, He had a brief stint in the shipyard uh, and he also um, was, a, I think, a two-time season writer for The Wire, uh, which is a classically Baltimore. And I think that The Wire became what it was because they hired people from Baltimore to set the scene. And so we'll hear from Rafael Alvarez uh, what he's been working on and what his uh, favorite places are in Baltimore, what he loves about it, what he hates about it, how he's dealing with the development of Baltimore Mm -hmm. and gentrification uh, that Baltimore, like many other cities, uh, is suffering. And And then we're also going to talk about a book uh, that you recommended. It's called The Cook-Up by Dee Watkins. And boy, I was so glad that you recommended it. I I could not put it down. It was just an incredible piece of work. It's a a crack memoir. Um, And uh, at first I wasn't... uh, I was a little put off, to be quite honest, about uh, reading about crack and all its horrible effects. I have just no no real interest in that. But this was just unbelievable. Uh, it was quite a journey. Uh, and um, I'm so glad to have read it. But we're going to talk about that in uh, this episode and then the two other episodes that we're going to talk about uh, that focus on, on Baltimore. Uh, this, because this book it, about it, crack is like crack. It, it just took you, and it just took you down the streets. It took you into the bars. It took you into the inner workings of this drug market. We're going to talk about it later. I, I could get carried away right now, but I yeah, won't. I mean, much right. like a crack pipe, you can't put the book <laughs> you, you can't down put it. every single time. Yeah, let's. Uh, uh, right. There's so much you can say about it. I agree. I agree. All right. So you 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 actually had a good idea, which is to start talking about the the um, the cook up in terms of three things. First of all, you know the history, what it tells us about Baltimore, yeah. and, and then, then city life and segregation, some of the yeah. issues of the city. Yeah. And then the future, and I haven't really gotten to the future yet. Okay. So um, there's time. There's time. But we could we could start talking about the history. Uh, you know, I mean, where do you where do you what what do you think is the best part where where some of the history is really revealed of uh, Baltimore and and uh, Watkins' relationship to to the so history? When when we went to Baltimore, I think the word I heard most there, uh, more than I've heard anywhere else, is the word multi generational, hmm. and they talked about it uh, in various panels. But mostly with respect to addiction, and I thought the one of the compelling uh, components of D. Watkins' memoir is that he's talking about boys who are seeing their uncles around, and their uncles want to score crack, or their uncles will wash their car in exchange for mm-hmm. twenty dollars and some crack, and uh, D. talks about how he sees family members around here and there who are all involved to some degree with drug trade. Right. And he's got, he gets a mentor uh, that we learn about in the uh, formative chapter, What the Fuck is Renal Dialysis? <laughs> which was <laughs> Great chapter. My very favorite chapter title in the whole book so far. I haven't finished it yet. All right. But, uh, um, I mean, we should say that one of the inciting events, as it were, as the literary professors like to say, is this guy, Bip, who is his older brother, who is the big drug t- dealer, you know, uh, par excellence. And right. he dies. I think he dies in a, in a gun sh- uh, uh, shootout of some kind. 
Um, and this what uh, and, and Bip is the guy who is very successful at this and has managed to stash a bunch of his proceeds in this huge safe that he is bequeathed to his younger brother who adores yeah. him who you know just totally worships this guy right so the crack is his inheritance it, from his worshiped dis, now deceased older brother that's the legacy and that's, that's what he gets that's incredible, and, and it's incredible the way he describes this safe. You know, he lugs the safe up. Like I'm trying to find the uh, passage where you know he's he's taking the safe, and he and he wonders whether he's going to open the safe right there and then, and he decides not to. He decides just to keep the thing, knowing you know. I mean, it just took forever to tr- drag it to his so-called crib. We got to use the drug language here. Oh, well, Lawrence, um, no, you don't. No, okay, all right. <laughs> just sounds crazy coming sounds from crazy. you. Sounds <laughs> crazy, crib. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he drags this thing up to his bedroom, and uh, he keeps it there for a good long while. Um, why do you think, uh, that's a good question uh, to me and to you, is why do you think he holds on to this, this safe and doesn't open it? Is it because well, he... I think he know. I think he doesn't open it because he knows what's in there, and he's trying to do what his brother wanted, which is go to school. But then right, right. college is horrible. Everybody's awful and treats him like garbage and looks down on him. And he knows that that there's something waiting for him at home that can turn him into a, a king, and he can get the respect that he deserves and the respect yeah. that his brother had. So there's this. It's not a, like a multi-generational problem. It's a multi-generational opportunity, and that opportunity is drug dealing. Right. And, and he takes it. Who, right. who wouldn't? I mean, would, what would you have done? Well, he does pretty well. I mean, he goes to Loyola. Is that right? Loyola yeah, College. Yeah, so. And he's, he's like, you know, I mean, it's not so bad there. Oh, um, it just sounded awful to me. The he people says, were miserable. All right, I was trying well, to go to these parties, and they're just He says, lame. it's so interesting the way he describes it. He says, uh, can I quote here? Loyola was a Gap commercial. This gives you an yeah. idea of his, oh, his, of his uh, you know, his writing skill. Loyola was a Gap commercial. Miles and miles of grass, new construction, and healthy smiles. I saw kickball and flag football and people holding hands. A universe of white and Asian faces smirked at me as I walked across the campus the first day. This was a different world, but not the one I was looking for. There were some other black guys there, but they weren't black like me. They spoke proper English, called each other dude, wore pastel colored sweaters, dockers and boat shoes, carried credit cards, chased ugg booted white girls, played sports other than basketball and talked about Degrassi. What the fuck is Degrassi? Oh, God, I, wore, I know. I wore, six bra- I wore six braids of uh, like Iverson, real Gucci sweatshirts like my brother, and about a $15,000 mix of my... Although, and that's the mark of an amazing writer. So, see, on the face of it, this looks like his success story. The guy oh. makes it. He goes into a... It's a nice cosmopolitan world. You know, they're not bad dudes. They won't kind of kill you for, for a dime or anything. These guys were would, would be accepting of you. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, even with his jewelry and his, his the rest of it. Uh, but he, he rejects them. He totally yeah. rejects them. Yeah, I mean, there was there were other parts later on where I think the he demonstrated that some, that people were less accepting and... I just, uh, I don't, it, it didn't See, sit. But he brings, sit he brings his me. city guy in there. See, well, what's kind of, I, it just, <laughs> just occurred to me. Why would you bring, you know, if you wanted a real positive experience, why would you want to bring one of your ghetto kids with you to a place like Loyola and have him kind of hang around and be your kind of body man, you know, uh, while you're partaking of this college experience? Well, I think it was it was just a horrific new world that he was in, and he needed something that was familiar. Also, he had just lost his brother not too long ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that was a big part. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you lose somebody close to you, and then you join the military or go to college or go embark on something, I think it's a lot harder than. than I, got, I I I got I got I agree I agree. Your situation is unchanged at home, so I think he just needed something to hold on to. He didn't. He couldn't mix in with with those 
Gap commercials. Well, listen to this. This gets even more bitter. He says, each day I float through Loyola clean and high. Some of the students were racist, but not to my face. And it probably wasn't their fault. Most of their parents gave them racism as a first gift. A few of my professors looked at me as if I was speaking a different language when I answered the questions. My philosophy teacher, a tweed coat wearing dickhead, was the worst. Every <laughs> class he'd say, what sport did you play to get into here? I honestly oh, thought about having Nick pistol whip him, but yeah. he was only a pedestrian on my road to bigger goals. He should have. He should have pistol whipped that <laughs> tweed wearing dick. Uh, it just makes me so angry hearing it again. <laughs> yeah, so this is the kind of stuff you've got to read it. Now, you won't get this kind of. Let, let me, because this is a preview show, so let me highlight this. This is not the kind of talk you get on any of the podcasts that I listen to around books. You get this very polite kind of uh, literary crit take. On, really? Yeah. You oh, don't get. Boring. You don't go. You don't get down into the depths of why you want to read some of this stuff. What's important about it? You 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 totally miss it. They they just do this kind of uh, you know weird. like they're in a classroom. Like they're huh. with the professor, and the professor is kind of grading them. Oh, did you talk about theme? Did you talk about metaphors? Did you talk about symbols? No, huh. we're, we're, I think what we're doing here is kind of getting to some of the, the good stuff. Yeah, no wonder I haven't heard of any of those podcasts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sound awful. All right, on that note, we're going to leave people with, hang it, so next, next week... Or the next time you listen to this podcast, this is podcast episode number one. Next time you listen to podcast episode number two, which we hope will be in two weeks, uh, we will get into an interview with De Deborah Rudisell. We'll talk to Rafael Alvarez, and we'll uh, find out about favorite places, and we'll continue that, that various Baltimore writers have around the city where they like to hang out. And we'll continue talking about this crack memoir, which is a totally a total blast. I wouldn't can't can't say enough about it. Right. So, and by that time, you would have finished it, and we would we'll be on a high, but no pun yeah. intended. A crack high. I, but almost a, a, a crack, crack high. A crack memoir high. We're not right. We're not, right. Right. Exactly. We're not we, on we, crack. we we and we don't um, authorize. We don't, we, we don't use, and we don't. No. Uh, we don't um, authorize crack use, no, even no. if it makes the most brilliant memoir we've ever read. Right, right, it is incredible. But he, I think he was off it when he when he wrote it. But you it, think it, so? It, but but the, the uh, I mean, you you definitely get. I th I think you know, like Thomas De Quincey back in the 18th century. There, were, and we will talk about this. There, there are a number. Uh, I've got actually on my book bookshelf. It's called Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Uh, mm. There's, 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 there's a way in which people who've been exposed to drugs, like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, here's another one, have an enormously. Uh, the Beatles or another another group have uh, expanded consciousness. Um, I mean, this is not fashionable to say, and it's not politically correct to say. You but sound they, like you're high. No, no, I, I really do believe this. They've got access to uh, emotions and feelings and to words and vocabulary and to descriptive powers that most of us who don't partake do not have. Except now, for I, people that use PCP. <laughs> they have access to fewer words. Right, right. But <laughs> and <laughs> exactly. more stabbing. All right, right. I get that. But there are certain drugs that are pretty, I, I mean... Clearly, there's a price to be paid. Uh, fortunately, uh, our friend D. Watkins didn't have to pay it. But there's certain prices that, that you know the, these drugs are about. But uh, when when they've um, they they've partaken in a certain experience, uh, and I guess it's very few people who actually can survive and have the talent and the writing chops to be able to write about it in a way which is convincing and revealing and all the rest of it. So it's not everybody. It's not like if you take crack, you take these other drugs, you're going to be a great writer. We're not saying that. We're just saying there's a certain kind of talented person. Well, and it's who, also like if you don't take drugs, you're also not going to be a great right, writer. Right, right, right. So <laughs> you have to then diagram the drug use yeah, and the great writing, exactly. and then you have to find an agent. It's nearly impossible. And then impossible. you have to find an agent. 
uh, and and there are multiple barriers and steps along the way. And I agree. so many barriers. <laughs> so, um, all right. With that, uh, we'll we'll look forward to seeing you next time or hearing from you next time. Please email us at radiobooktour at gmail dot com. Um, reach out to us and um, find us. Uh, we will find you. Um, and we'll send you a newsletter if you subscribe. If you send on our website, radiobooktour.com, you'll see a sign up for a newsletter. Uh, do that, and we'll, uh, we'll get you into the special club where you'll, you'll find out about future episodes and where we're going next. That's always a mystery. It's kind of a, like a magical mystery tour where we're going next. We're going to hold some secrets back, but we are definitely traveling. Any final words, uh, Jessica? I don't know. See you next time. Okay. Next city. Four and three and two and one, one. Thanks for listening to Radio Book Tour. Be sure to visit our site, www.radiobooktour.com, and sign up for our newsletter. We are a member of the Patreon network. Be sure to subscribe to us and give us a positive review on iTunes. Thanks again for listening.